Track looks solid, unchanging, but it wears down quietly. Stress builds, issues form, and if they're missed, the consequences are devastating. Behind every sleeper and stretch of rail is a lesson we had to learn the hard way, and it's the story every engineer should know. In this video, we're looking at the derailments that force Britain to rethink how it builds, maintains, and monitors the one thing no train can run without the track beneath its wheels. On the 17th of October in the year 2000, the GNER Express derailed at over 115 miles per hour on the Downfast line near Hatfield. The fourth coach passed over a fractured rail. The rail disintegrated into over 300 pieces. Four people died. Dozens were injured. The cause? Rolling contact fatigue, a form of defect that starts at the surface and spreads with each passing wheel often unnoticed until failure. At Hatfield, it had already advanced. Track inspections were limited. Ultrasonic testing at the time wasn't capable of reliably detecting early RCF. Defects were overdue, and renewal of the rail? Well, that had already been deferred. This wasn't just mismaintenance, it was known and postponed. That stretch had a backlog of reported faults, but no one assessed the risk of leaving them unresolved. As mitigation, Speed restrictions were put in place after the incident across the network. This crippled performance. Delays, cancellations and widespread disruption lasted for months. Railtrack, the private company responsible for the railway infrastructure, collapsed under the weight of its failures. A new organisation, Network Rail, was formed to take its place. Hatfield didn't just reveal a broken rail, it exposed the cracks in how the industry handled risk. By the way, if you want to understand how layout, inspection and safety all connect to each other, I put together a free email course on horizontal track geometry below in the description. On the 10th of May 2002, a West Anglia Great Northern service left King's Cross, heading for King's Lynn via Cambridge. Just before 12.55, as it passed through Potter's Bar Station at over 97 miles per hour, the train ran over a set of points, 2182 alphas. Midway through the train, the switch lost alignment, sliding out of position as the train passed over. This sudden shift caused the rear bogey of the third coach to derail. The fourth coach came off the track completely, striking the platform and collapsing part of the platform canopy. Seven people were killed, dozens more injured. The root cause lay in the stretcher bars, the metal bars that hold the switch rails the correct distance apart. On these points, the nuts securing the bars had worked themselves loose, and when they failed, the switch rails couldn't stay aligned. Testing later confirmed it wasn't a one-off. This stretcher bar design was prone to gradual loosening over time. At the time, the points were maintained by Jarvis, a private contractor. The investigation highlighted poor quality inspection and missed opportunities to catch the issue before failure. It wasn't just the hardware, it was how checks were done and how faults were allowed to persist. What followed was a wave of changes. Redesigned stretcher bars with a locking feature, stricter tool procedures, and the expansion of remote monitoring and critical infrastructure. By the end of 2003, all mainline track maintenance was brought back in-house under Network Rail. Potter's Bar showed that design and maintenance can't be treated separately. When both are weak, failure isn't just possible, it's inevitable. On the 23rd of February 2007, a Virgin Pendolino service from London to Glasgow was passing through Cumbria at around 95 miles per hour. As it approached a crossover near the village of Greyrig, the points beneath the rail moved. One of the switch rails moved out of position and the train derailed at speed. All nine coaches left the track. One passenger was killed. More than 80 were injured. The problem was traced back to a set of missing and loose nuts and the bolts on one of the stretcher bars. The same type of component involved at Potter's Bar just five years earlier. Without them, the switch rails weren't held in position and under a moving train, that proved fatal. A scheduled visual inspection five days earlier should have included that set of points, but it was missed. The supervisor agreed to extend his inspection, but the extension was never carried out. The degraded components were never seen. No action was taken. The investigation led to renewed scrutiny of inspection routines, task verification, and the systems used to track component condition. 
It also accelerated the rollout of remote condition monitoring, already in progress after Potter's bar, but now seen as essential, not option. Ray Rig didn't just echo Potter's bar, it proved the same weaknesses are still there and confirmed the warning. When critical parts aren't secured and checks don't happen, disaster is only a matter of time. Each of these derailments left a mark, and not just on the track, but on how the industry protects it. From Hatfield, we got the understanding of rolling contact fatigue, and with it, better inspection procedures, better detection tools, and risk based maintenance. From Potter's bar, we saw the danger of unsecured stretcher bars and the system-wide redesign that followed, locking fastenings, stricter talking checks, and the better material for high-stress assemblies. Greyrig hammered home that the risks exposed at Potter's Bar hadn't been fully resolved. It wasn't just a question of hardware, it was a failure in how inspections were planned, recorded, and verified. This led to tighter protocols, better training, and clearer traceability for every check. Remote condition monitoring technology was already emerging as something the railway needed to embrace. These incidents made that shift urgent, especially for switches and crossings. In the years that followed, that shift transformed inspection and maintenance. Today, we rely on sensors, a track point movement, actuation time, and fault states, digital inspection records, not handheld notes, and standardized component designs that are more resistant to failure. They are business as usual now, but only because of the consequences of not having them were made so clear. Track failures today are rare, but they haven't disappeared. Rails can still crack, switches can still work loose, ballast can still shift, and when problems do occur, it's often not one issue, but several interacting quietly beneath the surface. It's the combination, not just the individual faults, that turns risks into derailments. What's changed isn't the physics, it's the mindset. Track safety is no longer built around one person's inspection. Today it's layered and increasingly automated. Digital inspection trains like the ultrasonic testing unit and plane line pattern recognition train survey thousands of miles of track at speed capturing track geometry, rail wear, and defects automatically. They don't replace the human role, they strengthen it, catching what even a trained eye might miss and give teams more certainty earlier. That's the shift. Human inspection, digital verification, remote alert, safer component design, and tighter controls on risk. Failures like Hatfield, Potter's Bar and Grey Rig exposed more than technical weaknesses, they revealed how quickly problems can grow when those layers don't connect. And the lessons still hold, because even now, when one layer is missing, the next one has to catch it. Today's railway runs on more than steel and systems, it runs on lessons, painfully learned. Track safety isn't about fixing what's broken, it's about making sure the next train never finds it. The lessons come at a cost. We didn't adopt this we didn't adopt these systems by choice. They were built on tragedy and they and they must never be taken for granted. If you want to understand how track layout fits into all of this and how better design can reduce the risks in the first place, check out my free horizontal geometry email course. The link is in the description.